exalt your name this morning. We lift you on high and pray that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart would be acceptable in your sight. Amen. You can be seated. And uh, good morning. As Tim mentioned, we are inverting our service a little bit this morning. Sometimes it's good just to mix things up. But this morning we're doing it because my plane leaves at 1217. So uh, I will be done on time. Okay? And then the plan is that when, when we're done with the message this morning, we will uh, uh, we'll, we'll sing some songs in response to that. And we'll have communion and we'll finish our service that way. If you are 5, 6, 7, and 8, uh, you are dismissed this morning to go to Super Sunday. So you can head on to the back and Mr. Mike will take you back into the Super Sunday room. That's for the 5, 6, 7, and 8-year-olds. Everybody else, if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, turn to the book of Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. Uh, I am disappointed, I'll just say this at the beginning, I'm disappointed that I'm going to be gone tonight and miss the ice cream and the movie. And I've tried to decide which I'm more disappointed about, the ice cream or the movie. It's a great movie. Uh, the ice cream's also good, but I do hope that you can be back here at 6.30 for ice cream, 7.15 for the movie Woodlawn tonight. Just a good summer activity and a good opportunity for you to think about some friends this afternoon who you could call and just say, you want to go uh, get some ice cream and go to a movie tonight? And uh, the, the movie Woodlawn, for those of you who have not watched the trailer, it's about how God worked in a, a really surprising way in Birmingham, Alabama in the 1970s to bring racial harmony at a high school that was integrated, uh, recently integrated. It's the story of Tony Nathan, who was a big football player, went on to the University of Alabama and, and had a pro career as well. But it's, uh, it's his story. And it's really, it's a compelling uh, piece of history, and uh, I, I'd encourage you to come for it tonight. L last weekend, we were in Denver. While you were here with Henry Lynn, we were in Denver because uh, our son James had the opportunity to preach at his church uh, where he's on staff, and so we flew out to hear him. That's the second time he's preached there, and it was a joy to be there and hear him uh, open up God's Word. He did a great job. Last Sunday was also National Cheesecake Day, and so we were able to celebrate that in a very in, uh, strategic way as well, down on the mall having a cheesecake. This morning, we are going to be diving into a, a challenging and significant portion of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 6, the first half of that chapter, uh, one interpreter I read said, this is maybe the hardest passage to, to interpret, to exegete of all of Romans. Uh, but another commentator I read said this is this is really at the heart of what's in this book. So if you're a visitor, we're going through the book of Romans this year. We started back in March, I think, and we're just working our way piece by piece through this book. Uh, Romans is where Paul is communicating with the church in Rome, and he is explaining to them uh, the, the gospel the life-changing, revolutionary, realigning, reprioritizing message of the gospel. He wants to make sure they understand this. And this is not just a message that Jesus came to deliver to us. This is the message that Jesus is our deliverer. It's not simply new information. It's good news. It is good news of a historical event. Jesus came, and because of the life he live, lived and the death he died... Uh, we can be delivered from sin, and we can uh, have our lives realigned. We can be delivered from ourselves, and we can be delivered from the penalty and punishment that we deserve. So this is not just something Jesus taught. It is the story of his life, and Paul is explaining the significance of the life of Jesus in the book of Romans. I'll give you just a quick uh, contextualization to get us to where we are in chapter 6. Uh, chapters 1, 2, and half of 3 are the bad news. Everybody's in trouble, Jews and Gentiles. All have sinned. That's what the first two and a half chapters of Romans makes clear. And then starting in the middle of chapter 3 and through the end of chapter 4, Paul says, but there is a plan. There's a rescue. There's deliverance available in Christ. Because of what Jesus did, we can be justified and we can be righteous before God. That's the second half of Romans 3. And then in Romans 4, he says, Abraham... This is how Abraham was justified and made righteous through Jesus. Even though it was 2,000 years before Jesus came, God was still working through the message of the gospel even in the life of Abraham. That's chapter 4. 
And then chapter 5 begins with Paul saying, so if you are united with Christ through justification, through the gospel, if, if you are in union with Christ, here's what you have. You have peace with God. You have joy, even in the midst of, of trial. You have grace. You have the love of God shed in your heart. You have hope. You have all of this because you are in union with Christ. That's the first half of chapter 5. And then the second half of chapter 5 is, well, how does that work? How does what one man did give all those benefits to so many? And the answer is imputation. In the same way that you are plagued with sin because of what Adam did, in the same way you can be set free because of what Jesus did. That's what he explains in the second half of chapter 5. And that gets us to where we are this morning at the beginning of chapter 6. If you look back at the end of chapter 5, he says there, he says, uh, he, he talks about the reign of sin and death and the reign of grace and life. And that's a good jumping off point for where we are this morning. Paul's going to start this, this next chapter. Of course, there weren't chapters when he wrote it, but he's going to start this next section of his letter by answering a question that has dogged him throughout his ministry. It's, it's something that his Pharisee friends, remember he was a Pharisee when he was growing up, he was schooled as a Pharisee, and his Pharisee friends are accusing him with this new gospel that he's preaching of being an antinomian. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, they're saying that, that uh, it's still the law that makes you right before God. Paul's saying, no, it's not the law, it's grace. And if you look back at verse 20 of chapter 5, he says the law was not given as a path to righteousness. The law was given to reveal sin. Where, where the law came, sin abounded. As soon as you had the law, you had more opportunities to sin against God. We talked about that in that, in that passage. So the law exposes our rebellion. It increases our rebellion. And that was its purpose. God gave us the law so that we would recognize our sin, so that we would flee to grace. And then it says, where sin abounded, this is right at the end of, of Romans 5, where sin abounded, grace superabounded. Grace abounded much more. So no matter how sinful you got, there's more grace. Grace happened, grace superabounded. No matter how bad your sin is, God's grace is beyond that. Which brings us to this charge where the critics say, well, if that's true, wouldn't it logically follow that if when you sin, God pours out more grace and God's grace is a good thing to have? So doesn't it make logical sense that you ought to continue to sin, increase your sin, because when you do, God increases his grace. There's always more grace than sin. Shouldn't you continue in sin so you get more grace? Because grace is a good thing. It's a good question. It's a logical question. And that's what he's going to address. In fact, this came up earlier. Keep your finger where you are. Just turn back a page to Romans 3 and look at verse 8. Paul has already addressed this when he said, the question comes up, why not do evil that good may come? And then he adds, which some people are slanderously charging us with saying. He didn't answer it then. He's going to answer it now. And, and as I said, it's a logical question. Not only is it a logical question, but it, it's appealing. If that's, if that's how this works, there's some appeal to that, right? I mean, if it makes sense that if sin abounds, and it appeals to us, why? Because sin is fun. Because we're drawn to sin. Because we like it. Ray Steadman says that it's fun and we like to do it. So we're looking for anything that will give us an, an excuse to sin. And if this gives us an excuse to sin, we say, I'm in. I get to sin all I want and grace abounds. That sounds like the religion for me. But Paul's going to answer that charge. That believing that salvation comes by grace does not mean you have a new license to sin. That's the ultimate answer we're going to get to. In this passage this morning, he explains why grace doesn't lead you to sin. Because if you really understand grace, you also understand that you're now dead to sin. That's his answer, as we'll see. In fact, if you wanted to title the message this morning, the title would be, You're Dead, Now Act Like It. Okay? That's what Paul is saying in the first half of Romans 6. You're dead, so act like it. So let's read the passage together. 
and we'll dive in and, and start to explore it. Let me pray for us as we dig into God's Word. Pray with me. Um, Father, we're about to hear you speak to us. These words that I'm about to read come from you. Uh, when I read this passage, we'll be hearing you speak. So we ask that you would give us the aid and assistance we need this morning to listen carefully and hear clearly what your Spirit is saying to each of us this morning. And we ask that as we listen and seek to understand this passage, that you would use your word to continue molding us and shaping us into the image of your Son. Speak to us through this passage, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans 6, we'll begin at verse 1. You follow along as I read this. And again, I'm going to read it kind of slowly and let it sink in. Okay, here we go. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ is being raised that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passion. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Amen. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Here's the outline of this passage for us this morning. The, the first point is the logical question. That's in verse 1. Then we have the emphatic answer in verse 2. And then verses 3 through 10 are where he explains what dead to sin means. Verse 11 is where he explains how you apply being dead to sin. And verses 12 through 14 is how you live it out. Okay? So that's what we're going to walk through as we go through it. And it starts with that that question, the logical question, the one the Pharisees have been leveling against Paul, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? This is what theologians refer to as antinomianism. You heard that word before? Antinomianism. Anti means against. Nomos is the Greek word for law. So an antinomian is somebody who's against the law. That means that they look at the law and say, it has nothing, I have nothing to do with it. It's not I'm, I'm, I don't have to worry about the law. I'm not under the law. An antinomian says, I can do whatever I want. The law can't touch me. Okay? Now, let me say three things about this way of thinking, this antinomianism. First of all, before we talk about the problem that antinomianism is, we need to make sure that we understand that antinomianism has a twin brother, and the twin brother's on the other side of the fence, and that's legalism. And legalism is just as damnable and just as deadly as antinomianism is. And the reason we need to say this is because it's easy for us to look at antinomians who say, I can do whatever I want, and go, that's wrong. But it's maybe harder for us to look at legalists and say, that's equally wrong. And we have to understand that. The antinomian says this. He says, I'm saved by grace. So how I live doesn't matter anymore because God's going to forgive me because he loves me. I can do whatever I want. 
That's the thinking of the antinomian. Now, let me ask you, is that true? Well, there's a sense in which it's true, but we have to be very careful about the I can live however I want part of that. Because the big question is, what do you really want? You see, when God converts a person, he starts to work on his wants. And if what you really want is to sin, you have to ask a question, did God really do a work in me? So can you do whatever you want? Well, let's talk about what you want. That's, the, that's how you have to deal with the antinomian. The antinomian is the one who, in all of his fervor for God's love, his grace-filled, all-forgiving characteristics, he will downplay the necessity of transformation, holiness, obedience in the life of a Christian. He says, we need to focus not on all of these, this doing, just focus on the fact that God loves you and he accepts you and rest in that. There's some truth there, right? Got to be careful. Meanwhile, though, the legalist says, we're saved by grace alone, but if you have a really messy life with a whole lot of sin, you're probably not really saved. You know people like that? Self-righteous folks who say, yeah, I know you say you're saved, but I saw you smoke, right? Right? This is where you, you start to add a whole bunch of stuff that's not in the Bible, and you say, well, if you do that, if you do that, if you do that, maybe you're not really saved. If your life is really all that messy, maybe you're not really saved. So we can say that the legalist is somebody who, in his fervor for God's holiness and righteousness and godliness, he downplays the idea that God is loving, grace-filled, and, and all-forgiving. Both are true. God is loving, full of grace, and all-forgiving. God wants obedience and righteousness. And we have to accept that those are parallel truths. And whenever you lean to one side and say, I'm going to focus on God's grace and ignore the, the behavior, that's a problem. When you ever focus on the behavior and ignore the grace, that's a problem. So we are probably, you and me, I don't know all of you, but we're probably more prone to legalism than we are to antinomian. We're going to read this passage. Here's what I want. I just want to make sure when we read this and you go, yeah, Paul, you get those antinomians, okay? You tell them. You give it to them. I just want to make sure that in our fervor to want to promote righteousness and godliness and holiness, we don't lose sight of the fact that there's something in this that we need to be paying attention to. And that's really the second thing I want to say about antinomianism is that most of the time the antinomian is presenting a half-truth. It's not untrue, it's just not the whole truth. J.I. Packer has said that a half-truth masquerading as the whole truth is a complete untruth. So when you hear what the antinomian says, you, you will say, well, now wait, that, that sounds right, but it feels wrong. And the reason is because it's a half-truth, it's just not the whole truth. Let me give you some examples of antinomian half-truth, okay? If you're a child of God, God loves you no matter what you do or how you live. Is that true? Yeah, but, right? Here's another one. If you're a Christian, God is never displeased with you because his love is unconditional. How about this? There is no relationship between God's saving grace and our holiness and obedience. You see the tension? You hear those things and you go, yeah, okay. That's kind of true, but, right? So we have to understand that when you hear an antinomian speak, there's a kernel of truth in each of those statements. But without some clarification or understanding of the totality of the gospel, you can have a dangerously wrong understanding of what the Bible teaches here. What does verse 1 say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul gives a strong no. He says, put that out of your mind. In fact, I want to point you to two really important verses. These are verses that you ought to have bookmarked in your brain. You ought to, you ought to be able to say to folks, Galatians 5.13 and Titus 2.11 and 12 you just ought to have those markers. If you had to memorize, that would be good. But if you just knew what they are and had a general idea what they said, it would be good. Galatians 5.13 says this, You were called to freedom, brothers. That's what the antinomian says. You're free. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. See the balance? 
You're called to freedom. But don't use freedom for the flesh. That's where the antinomian gets tripped up. I'm free, therefore I can indulge the flesh. No, no. That's not what God gave you freedom for. And then Titus 2 says this, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. The antinomian says, yes, hallelujah. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. That's the two sides. Grace is true. Obedience is true. When you hear somebody extolling grace and saying, I'm free from the law, I'm under grace, be very careful. It's a half-truth. Here's the third thing we need to remember about antinomians. Sometimes in our zeal to to oppose the error of antinomianism, we get scared away from boldly proclaiming the truth of grace. Has anybody ever accused you of sounding like an antinomian when you present the gospel. Anybody ever said, sounds like you don't think holiness really matters. If nobody has ever accused you of that, maybe you're not talking enough about grace. Because guess who they accused of that? Paul. If you're not proclaiming grace so boldly and so completely that some people are going, wait, time out. Maybe you're not making it clear enough the truth about grace. I'm not suggesting you drift toward antinomianism, but I'm suggesting that Paul, in presenting his gospel, had some Pharisees going, wait a sec, he answers it right here. And we need to answer it when the charge comes up. But we also need to be making sure that we're real clear that salvation, our salvation, is by grace alone through faith alone. And that's for messy people, that's for broken people, that's for people who you look at and go, I don't know if they can really be saved because their life is really ugly and messy. They're not nice looking like me. The Apostle Paul's bold declaration of God's free gift of grace and forgiveness and mercy being poured out on his children led people to say, that sounds a little like antinomianism. And he said, I'm glad you think so. So we should be bold in our proclamation of the good news. And if we wind up leaving some people a little uncomfortable, we're probably headed in the right direction. Paul answers this logical question. Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? His answer is a very strong, very emphatic answer that says, no. May it never be. God forbid. I mean, there's all kinds of translations of that megenita phrase that we see throughout Romans where it's a strong, emphatic, it's a pound the table. Absolutely not. You've got to be kidding me. Put that thought out of your mind. That's what he's saying here. So he's not soft with this accusation. When somebody says, well, are you saying that we should continue in sin? He doesn't say, well, no, you didn't understand me. No, he said, no, no. How, he says, here's the rationale why we shouldn't. He said, how can we who died to sin continue to live in it? That is a pivotal statement. In fact, everything that follows in this chapter, in chapter 6, is simply an unpacking of what that means. If you highlight, if you underline in your Bible, highlight and underline that. This, what, what does this mean? James Boyce, the pastor at 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, uh, before his death, he makes a strong statement about Romans 6 2. He says, It's the most important verse in the Bible for believers in evangelical churches to understand today. Okay, so we're in pretty, pretty important territory this morning. How do we understand what it means to talk? to be dead to sin. What does this verse mean? Let me talk first about what it does not mean. It does not mean that if you're a a child of God, you no longer have any desire for sin or you become unresponsive to the lure of sin. Now, I know why you think that because oftentimes when the Bible talks about being dead to something, that's what it means. In Ephesians chapter 2 at the beginning, it says we were dead in our trespasses and sins. You know that? And what that means is we were dead. We were unresponsive to God. We had no desire for God. We weren't even listening. We were completely dead to God. So you think, well, if that's what dead means there, does it mean the same thing here? No, it doesn't. The problem with your understanding of that as the meaning here is that it doesn't work that way. Anybody here who is completely unresponsive to and has no appetite for sin? Right. Anybody know anybody like that? Anybody who thinks they're like that? 
is in trouble because isn't it John who says if anybody says he has no sin he's a liar right so it can't mean that we're now unresponsive to the temptation of sin or we have no appetite for it that's not the meaning it's also not saying that we should be dying daily to sin now that's true but that's not what this verse is teaching We should be dying daily to sin, but this verse doesn't say that's what you should be doing. This verse says you have died. It doesn't say you should be dying. It says you have died. So it's something that past tense. You get a clue for what he's talking about here if you look down at verses 9 and 10 in chapter 6 where it says we know that Christ being raised from the dead, this is talking about physical death, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin. Jesus died to sin. Now that's an interesting thought. And it helps crack open the door to what we're talking about. Whatever it means for Jesus to be dead to sin is connected to the fact that we're dead to sin. Let me give you my best shot at explaining what I think dead to sin means here. 25 years ago last week, Mary Ann and I got on an airplane and flew from San Antonio, Texas to Little Rock, Arkansas to meet Dennis Rainey and talk about moving here. And it, it's an interesting story. I wish I could had time to tell you the whole story. Um, we were living in San Antonio, and back at the beginning of the spring, our pastor at our church said, I'm going to be taken off three weeks for vacation this summer, three Sundays. Could you fill the pulpit for me for those three weeks that I'll be gone? And I did pulpit supply sometimes at the church but usually it was a one off I'd get you know I'd get a Sunday here or a Sunday there so I really didn't get a chance to to unpack anything larger than one passage so having 3 weeks in a row I thought um okay well I could do something like maybe even a small book what should I do and I decided back in the spring that I was going to when, when my time came at the end of July and the beginning of August I was going to preach through the book of Jonah four chapters long I can get through Jonah in, in three weeks. That'll give me a chance to, to go through, all, through it all. So it just so happened that on the morning, that Sunday morning that we were flying to Little Rock, I preached that morning before we flew about the reluctant prophet who did not want to go to Nineveh. And then I got an airplane and did not want to go to Little Rock, okay? So we've always said to people that we moved to Nineveh, Arkansas, because it's better to be in the will of God than in the belly of the big fish, right? So it was, a, it was a pivotal time. But 25 years ago, this was the week that we came up and we visited uh, Little Rock. Now, at the time that we flew up there, we were living in San Antonio. We were Texans. If you had looked at my driver's license, I had a Texas driver's license. I paid my property tax to the state of Texas. Texas was our official residence. I was under the jurisdiction and the laws of the state of Texas. That's who I was accountable to. I lived in Texas. I was under the laws of Texas. Six months later, we were living in Arkansas. I now had an Arkansas driver's license. I now had Arkansas plates on my car. I no longer had any tax liability in Texas. I was no longer under the jurisdiction of Texas. If somebody had come to me and said, you need to pay property taxes for your property in San Antonio, I would have said, I don't own that property anymore. I'm free from those taxes. In fact, I could have said, I'm dead to those taxes because I'm no longer under that jurisdiction. Now, there were and there are still things about Texas that I love. I love the cheeseburgers at Chris Madrid's. In fact, I was thinking about this. Most of the things I love about Texas are (laughs) food-related, which may say more about me than it says about Texas, right? But I love the tortillas from the Alamo Cafe, I love the river walk. I love the hill country. I love the fact that there's no state income tax in Texas. I, and as you know, I love the Spurs, the San Antonio Spurs. And the stars at night, they do shine bright deep in the heart of Texas, okay? But as of 25 years ago, I'm no longer a Texan. I don't have any legal connection to that state. I am now an Arkansan. I am under the jurisdiction, under the laws of the state of Arkansas. So in a sense, I'm dead to Texas. I'm alive to Arkansas. I may still dream about the Riverwalk. I may even vacation in Texas from time to time, but it's not my home anymore. 
Back at the end of Romans 5, Paul says there is a reign of sin and death and there's a reign of righteousness and life. And before you knew Christ, you lived in the land of sin and death. And the governor of the land of sin and death is Satan. And you owed your allegiance and your taxes and everything to Satan in the land of sin and death. But when you were adopted into the family of God, you were transferred out of the land of sin and death into the land of grace and life. The governor in the land of sin and life is Jesus. And the, it, there's a whole different structure. It's not like you moved and they just changed a few of the laws. It's a whole different country. But this is where you live now. Your citizenship here is, is in the land of life and grace. And that's where your jurisdiction is. The laws of the old place no longer apply to you. You're dead to those. And if somebody, Satan, tries to bring you under those laws, you can say, I'm dead to that. I don't have to live there anymore. Now, you may think back to some of the good times you used to have back in the land of sin and death, back when you had fun back there. And you may, you may think, uh, you know, sometimes I, I wish I could go back there. You may even vacation there from time to time. You may find yourself reflexively acting the way you used to act when you lived there because it just became a habit for you. Old habits die hard and old patterns run deep, right? So if we just imagine geographically that Texas is the land of sin and death, and I'm not trying to suggest that it is, although some diehard Razorback fans think that Texas is, in fact, the land of sin and death, and that Arkansas is now the land of grace and of life, here's how the argument of Romans 6 runs for you. When you were still in Texas, God poured out his grace that was greater than all your sins, and he transferred you from Texas to Arkansas. Should you continue to live like a Texan so that you can get more grace from God? No, that's silly. You don't live in Texas anymore. You're no longer Texans. You're an Arkansan. You're dead to Texas. But don't we need to continue to sin that grace may abound? No, we live in the land of grace now. Grace abounds to us every day here, whether we're sinning or not. I think that's a good picture of what Paul is driving home here when he says you're dead to sin. Let me give you another illustration. 38 years ago, on May 19th at 10.30 in the morning, Mary Ann Alabak died. Because that morning somebody said, the two are one. I now pronounce you Mr. and Mrs. Bob Lapine. You see, Mary Ann had a chapter of her life that was the chapter before she was married and a chapter afterwards. And her old life of singleness, she's now dead to that. She's now a married woman, and she has new responsibilities and also new benefits that come from that. Now, it's not good for two people after they're married to do things they used to do when they were singles, right? Like dating other people, that's not a good thing. Or thinking, I'll just make that decision on my own and not consult my spouse. You can do those things, but it will not go well for you, right? So now, here's what Paul is saying. He says, you used to be single. Now you're married, so live like you're a married person. You're dead to your singleness. You're dead to Texas. Those are the illustrations that give us an idea of what he means when he says you're dead to sin. Does sin, sin still tempt you? Yes. Can you still participate in sin? Yes, you do. So what does it mean you're dead to it? It means you don't live there anymore. Start, you're dead. Start living like you're dead. So now verses 3 through 10 help illustrate and explain what he's talking about here. And two things to note in this section, in 3 through 10. The first thing to note is that we will often see the word die, dead, or death showing up. In fact, I think it's verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, die, dead, death. It's all over this. It's all about die, dead, and death. Second thing to note is that there are three times that he says, do you not know, or you know, or you know. You find that at the beginning of, I, I don't where verse 3, I think he said, I don't have it marked out here. So anyway, there are three places in this passage that say you know. So here's what Paul is saying. In order to understand that you are dead to sin, there are some things you need to know. 
You need to not just know them intellectually, you need to know them bone deep. You need to know that you know that you know and really believe that this stuff is true, these things you need to know. For you to understand that you're dead to sin, let's look at the three things you need to know. Number one, you need to know that you are fully united with Jesus. You are fully united with Jesus. You are immersed in him and in his death and his burial and resurrection. You are immersed. Why am I using that word? Because he talks about it in terms of baptism. The passage says, do you not know that all of you who have been immersed into Christ Jesus were immersed into his death? Now, the reason I'm using the word immersed there when I read that is because I don't think that this has primarily in mind water baptism. Water baptism is the symbol or the sign of what Paul is unpacking here, which is before you're ever in the water immersed, you are first immersed into Christ. When you become a Christian, Christ comes into you and you come into Christ. Christ is in you and Christ is all over you. So here's a reference that helps explain that. In 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 and 2, Paul, here's what he says. He says, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and passed through the sea and were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. What's a cloud and the sea? Well, the cloud is how God led the nation of Israel in the time of the Exodus. The sea is the sea that parted by God's power. So they, the, the, the fathers were under the cloud and in the sea and were baptized into Moses. What does it mean that they were baptized into Moses? It means that they learned, I better follow Moses if I want to be where God is. And so they became fully on board with Moses' leadership and Moses' agenda. Now, they still rebelled against Moses, right, even when he got the law. But they were all in saying, we better follow Moses. Well, that's what it means to be baptized into Christ. You're all in. Say, I better follow Jesus. If I want God's blessing on my life, I'm baptized into him. I better be following him. I'm under his leadership. Remember a few weeks ago when we went out and saw Ben Friesen and we saw Noah and Tucker Gurney get water baptized? Okay, when that happened and we lowered them into the water, how much of their body was not underwater? None. If any of it was not underwater, we didn't do a good job because we put them all under and then we pulled them all out. How much of their body was surrounded by water? All of it, not a part left unsurrounded. They were totally immersed. We're talking about in a spiritual sense, our life being fully absorbed or or, or, uh, engrossed, fully surrounded by Jesus, being all in. And that means, Paul says here, that if you're baptized into him, you're baptized into his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That means that you're in him, he's in you, and so if you're in him, then his death becomes your death, his burial is your burial, his resurrection is your resurrection. When you got into him, that's part of what you got, was his full death, burial, and resurrection experience. So when, when you got transferred into the new domain, the domain where Jesus is the king, you're now in Arkansas and Jesus is the governor, when you gained entrance into that, you are dead to sin because you're baptized into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's the first thing he's saying. Understand that you're dead to sin because you got the death, burial, and resurrection that Jesus had. Second thing is you need to know that you are dead to your old self. Verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin for one who has died has been set free from sin. If we've died with Christ, we believe we'll also live with him. What's this old self he's talking about here? Well, it's your old life. It's when you lived in Texas or when you were single. That's the old you. Now, when you got married or when you moved to Arkansas, you didn't become a different personality or you didn't look different but you now had a whole new status a whole new persona that old person that you were is now dead it's why Marianne had to get her driver's license changed and why when she gets a passport now it's got Marianne Lapine on there 
If she tried to get a passport with Marianne Alabak, they would say, we don't have any record of that person. They wouldn't give it to her. The old person is dead. Now, you will hear sometimes people will say, you know, every Christian's got an old man and a new man living inside of them. No, that's not true. The old man is dead. You do have the flesh warring against the spirit. You do have the old nature warring against the new nature, but the old man is dead. This is, this is the positional. It's who you are. Your old man has been crucified. This is, listen how John Stott the rector from England. Here, here's how he describes it. He says, suppose there's a man whose name is John Jones. He's an elderly Christian believer, and he's looking back on his long life. Stott says his career would be divided by his conversion in two parts. The old life, the old John Jones before his conversion, and the new life, the new self, John Jones after his conversion. The old self and the new self, or the old man and the new man, are not John Jones' two natures. They are two halves of his life separated by a new birth. At his conversion, which was signified in baptism, John Jones, the old self, died through union with Christ. The penalty of his sin was born. At the same time, John Jones rose again from death, a new man, to live in new life with God. He says, now John Jones is every believer. We're all John Jones if we're in Christ. The way in which our old self died is that we were crucified with Christ when we came into his family. A little further on, Stott says, our biography is also written in two volumes. Volume one is the story of the old man, the old self, me before my conversion. Volume two is the story of the new man, the new self, me after I was made a new creation in Christ. Volume one of my biography ended with the judicial death of the old self. I was a sinner. I deserved to die. I did die. I received my deserts in my substitute with whom I have become one. Volume two of my biography opened with my resurrection. My old life was finished. My new life in God had begun. That's what's being talked about here in verses six, seven, and eight when it says you are united with Christ and so your old self, your old person has died. Second Corinthians 5, you know it. If any man is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's what's being pictured here. If, if you're a visitor here this morning, before you leave, we have a, a visitor basket we'd like to give you. In that basket, there's a book called Beauty for Ashes. And that book is a story of it's 50 of our stories from people in this church, people who shared about their old life when they died, and what their new life has looked like. It's just 50 biographies that illustrate this is what God does in our lives. So RIP to the old life. Here's the third thing. We need to know that when you're dead to sin, this world is no longer your home. In fact, I found this picture. Can we put up the picture? I have a feeling we're not in Texas anymore. I changed that, okay? <laughs> I just put it over Kansas. So there's Dorothy right there. Here's what Paul says. He says, we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Christ is no longer in Texas. I don't mean that, you know, understand. Pull that out of context and, and get me in trouble with my Texas friends. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. The life he lives, he now lives to God. He's no longer under the jurisdiction of this world. Remember when Christ was a human when he lived in human flesh he was under the jurisdiction he lived in the world of sin he lived in Texas but when he was resurrected he's no longer under the jurisdiction of Texas and he's saying you may still wander around the streets of Texas but you're no longer a Texan does that make sense these verses are an essential summary of what Paul's been teaching about what it means to be dead to sin and alive to Christ. And he points out the fact that this is not only revolutionary, it's permanent. This is not something, this is not going to shift. You're not going to move back to Texas. You're not going to be reinstated as a citizen there. You are now, once and for all, an Arkansan. Now that leads us to verse 11, which is where Paul shifts from talking about what we ought to know about our union with Christ and about being dead to sin. Now he says, based on this knowledge, and you saw through there, you need to know this, you need to know this, you need to know this. Verse 11, he says, so as a result of all that you know, you must now, here's what you do, consider yourselves dead to sin 
and alive to God in Christ. Consider yourself that. Think about that. Dwell on that. Reprogram your mind so that that's your thinking. Don't just consider it once and go, well, I considered that. No. It, the, the word there is the word we've used before. It's the reckon word. You've you got to reckon this over and over again. You've got you to think on this, and you've got to recalibrate your life based on the fact that, oh, I'm dead to sin, I'm alive to Christ. That's, that's who I am. That's the new me. And you've got to be remembering and reminding yourself of that regularly. Count this as true about you. Once you know about your union with Christ, you have to understand you're not in Texas anymore. You now live in Arkansas. You're not in the land of sin and death. You're in the land of grace and life. So start living like that's true. You're a citizen in the land of grace and life. You're, not a, you're a member of God's family now, so live like that's true. And that leads to the final part of this chapter where Paul anticipates somebody saying, okay, just exactly how do you live like that's true? How do I do that? I understand I should reprogram my thinking so I go, I don't live there anymore. I live here now. I need to keep that in mind. I, I went out to lunch this week with a friend of mine who is over here for three weeks from England. Every time he comes to the United States, what does he have to remember that he's in the United States? What has to change? You've got to drive on the, wrong, on the right side. Excuse me. You've got to drive on the right side of the road because in London they drive on the wrong side of the road. He's got to remember every time he gets in the car Oh, yeah, I'm in Arkansas. This is how I drive. You have to remember every day, oh, yeah, I'm a child of God. I live in the land of grace. I need to live that way now. And that's what Paul is driving home here when he says, okay, reckon yourself as dead to sin and alive to Christ. Now, what do I do? Well, here's how you do. First of all, you have to actively resist the reign of sin in your life. You actively resist the right, this is verses 12, 13, and 14. It's a put off, put on. It's, it's, you're dead to this, you're alive to this. Actively resist participation in sin. You've heard in the news about people who describe themselves as being a part of the resistance, right? These are people who are on the political left who don't like the Trump administration and in fact they, uh, they're doing all they can to try to fight against the, the president. I found a website this is the website, More Than 99 Ways to Fight Trump. And you can't read all of this, but here it's got suggestions. When Trump calls, talks about millions of illegal voters, share an article that shows, I'm sorry, it's a bad word up there. Get, a, get that off the screen, will you? I didn't, I didn't read that carefully. Those of you in the back, just ignore. Those of you in the front, ignore, okay? Um, Let's just pray and we'll be done. The people who are, you remember when the president got elected, there were a, a number of people who were standing outside and they were chanting, not my president. You remember that? Okay. No, he is your president. Whether you like him or not, whether you like the last guy or not, they're your president. This is where you live. They're your president. And you saying not my president doesn't change things. Now, here's my point. Here's the reason I bring this up. These people are saying, we're going to actively resist the Trump administration. We got more than 99 ways, and we're coming up with new ones, and we're telling our friends, here's how you actively resist this. Why don't we do that with sin? Why aren't we coming up with ways to actively resist the power and domination of sin in our lives and making lists and sharing with our friends and saying, here's another way you can actively resist sin? I've got to be careful not to become a legalist in the middle of all of this. But the active resistance of the power of sin is what God's calling us to. Don't turn your body over to sin. What if you lived in Canada? I've moved from Texas to Canada now. What if you lived in Canada and the Trump administration said, we're going to start taxing Canadians 10%? Income tax because we need the money in the U.S., what would Canadians say? That's absurd. I don't live there. There's no jurisdiction here. I'm not going to surrender my money to you just because you say you want it. That's active resistance. So when the devil comes to you and says, wouldn't this be fun? You say, I'm not going to listen to you. Your stupid ideas. 
You have to have strategies for active resistance. You're no longer in the land of, land of sin and death. So don't let sin boss you around and try to make you obey. Don't surrender your life to sin. Just say, I'm dead to you. And then it says, so that's what it says. Let sin therefore not reign in your mortal body. You're not under it. Don't let it try to force you to obey its passions. Don't present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. Active resistance. But it's not just active resistance. In fact, if you try to just do active resistance, you'll lose. Because you also have to have active surrender to the land you're now in. It's not just active opposition to Satan, it's active surrender to Jesus. Present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Present your members to God. Your members is this, your body. Present you to God and say, here's my body, what do you want to do with it? Don't do that to Satan and sin, do it to God. For sin will have no dominion over you since you're not under sin under the law, you're under grace. The truth is, most of us are only passively engaged in the battle against sin. Let's just be real. Most of us just kind of float through and we're not, we're not really doing spiritual warfare in our battle with sin. We're just kind of saying, I'm going to try to avoid it. And, you know, if I get tripped up every once in a while, that's just human. As opposed to getting up every morning and saying, there's a war going on. I better get armored up and I better get ready for battle because I do not want today to have sin capture me. You have to start each day with a pledge of allegiance ceremony. I pledge allegiance to Jesus and to righteousness and to obedience. Resist sin, embrace grace. So this morning, we're going to take some time to respond to what we've heard here with singing and singing together as a way to prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper to come and take communion together. Let me close, though, with this question as we get ready to sing and get ready to take communion. I hope all of you believe, I hope you don't believe that you are saved and that means you can go on willfully, deliberately, shamelessly, and carelessly sinning. Anybody here who thinks, I'm a believer now, and it's okay for me to go on willfully, carelessly sinning? I hope nobody's thinking that, but here's the question. Is your life being lived so carelessly that someone who's far from church or far from God might look at you, and they might reasonably conclude that you're still alive and responsive to sin? Could they look at you and say, you know what? I think you delight in it. Could they look at you and say, I know you say you're from Arkansas, but you sure act like a Texan. Sure have that Texas accent. I, I sure hear you talking about Texas an awful lot. In other words, would they say, I look at your life and it looks a lot like mine. Or would they see a difference? Would a person see any evidence in your life that you are actively resisting sin and actively surrendering to Jesus? Would they see that as a rhythm or the pattern of your life? If you are in union with Jesus, you're dead to sin. You're dead, so start acting like it, okay? Pray with me. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace. Protect us, Father, from antinomianism or from legalism from self-righteousness or from carelessness or lawlessness. Lord, do the work that each of us needs done in our hearts. Apply this scripture and help us to remember every day that we're dead to sin. We don't live there anymore. We're your child. And help us to increasingly live accordingly. We pray these things in your name. Would you stand and let's sing together?
this as a neat moment to just stop and think of what the future holds for each of us that trust of you. That through our union with Christ, that well, you will be our, our light. You will be the one who we, we see face to face. And all the troubles of this life will melt away. All the sorrow will be gone. And joy alone in Christ will remain. And so we say, all glory to you. So, Father, as we start to consider now what it means to be united with Christ in this uh, time of communion, uh, be with us, lead us, God, and continue to uh, shepherd us with grace even in this moment. We pray in Jesus' good name. Amen. Amen. Um, you guys can have a seat. Uh, we have mixed, we kind of changed up the service a bit today. Um, um, and so now we come to a time of, of taking the Lord's Supper together, of communion. We call it communion because we are in a very unique way, remembering the union we have with Christ. We are communing with him. And so um, here at Redeemer, uh, we do open communion. So if you are a follower of Christ, you are one who's understood the message of today, and you are united with Christ, and you see a growing heart and love for Jesus, that you're welcome to take the Lord's Supper with us. You don't have to be a member here, just that you love Jesus and you know you're following him. Um, the way we do it is uh, we come up the outside aisles and uh, take the elements back to your seat and we'll take them together. You go back through the middle to your seat and uh, when everybody's come through, we'll all take them together and celebrate this because it's a time of celebration um, of all the Lord has done. And so um, we're going to prepare the table. So just take a minute. If maybe your hearts begin to wander, um, thinking about lunch, thinking about something else, just to pause and consider what God has done for us in Christ as we're going to take these elements together. So you do that now, and we'll get everything ready, and we'll tell you when we're ready to start. <laughs> ¶¶
night that Jesus had this great last meal with his disciples, the ones who had thought they knew everything about him, he reminded them that something new was coming, that there would be a union that was inseparable, that, that through his body there's a new and living way that wasn't bound up in the rules and the regulations, but it would be entrusting his finished work. And so as we come now, Father, we ask that you would give us great hope um, that we are united with Christ and the old is gone. And we don't have to try to earn it, but there's a new and living way through your body because you've paid for it once for all. So we can celebrate now our freedom in Christ to love and serve others. Help us enjoy you in this moment. We pray in Jesus' good name. So towards the end of the meal, he took a cup and he wanted to celebrate this last thing with his disciples to say, this is a cup of salvation. That this is going to be what my blood is going to be remembered every time you take the cup. That there is a payment for the forgiveness of sins. There is a sacrifice that is enough for you to be clean and forgiven and to draw near to God like you were made to. So Jesus, we thank you for your blood not only as followers of you, as people that belong to you, can we celebrate the the blood that was shed by our King. I pray that you'd help us be thankful um, as we enjoy this, as we enjoy the gift it is to remember that your blood has paid for our sins so we don't have to. So thank you for that, Jesus, we pray in your name. Well, now we're going to do announcements. So, because it's different today. So, oh, look, a little announcements music. I like that. Let's try that. Well, they're going to be short today anyways, because um, there's just a few things. We want to say the summer's kind of wrapping up. So, um, just want to remind you tonight, there is Woodlawn. Um, My mom actually went to a school called Woodlawn, and every time I hear it, I think it's like we're going to this elementary school. Um, But it's going to be a fun time. to watch some movie to eat ice cream. We hope you'll come. I know sometimes you're like, oh, back to church. We're not going to beat you with rods or anything. It's just watching a movie and eating ice cream. So we hope you'll come back. There'll be just a brief discussion. Uh, We're not going to do child care tonight just uh, because we've asked around and not a ton of people said they needed it. So if we'd love to have you here, um, come on out and eat ice cream at 630 and we'll start the movie about 7, 715. So we'll do that tonight. Um, Next Saturday is our next membership class. If you have not... um, signed up for that, made any mention of that, you've got some serious reading to do if you're planning on being here. Um, it's not heavy reading, but it's two books, and you've got to watch four videos. None of it's super intensive, but if you're interested in being a member and you've kind of been thinking you're going to do that next Saturday and you haven't said anything, please talk to me before you leave today. Um, they're not impossible reads, and you could do this, but uh, it is the new members class. Um, is not a way for you to become a member officially. It is a way to find out about membership here. And so that is next Saturday morning, 9 to noon. Um, If you are very interested and have questions, please talk to me. If you're like, man, I'd love to do that, can't make it happen, we'll do it again. So mark your calendar. It'll be coming up in November sometime. So uh, the last thing that I would want to remind you of is next Sunday, the 13th, is we're going to do a youth parents meeting. So if you have youth-aged kiddos, as I do now, um, we're going to have a meal. Uh, Bob's going to be here. Scott Rackley and I will help lead this meeting just to kind of talk about the future of what student ministry looks like here. If you've not looked in our nursery and in our children's ministry, we're going to have youth. <laughs> we're not far from it. And sometimes we look and we go, well, we don't have a ton of youth right now. Well, we have some and we want to care for them now, but we also want to think about the future. So if we want you as parents to be a part of that process. We don't want to tell you exactly. We want to give you some insight, but also hear from you what you'd like to see. So um, stay after church next Sunday. Um, we will have food, we will have drinks, and we will have some fun together talking about the future of student ministry. All right? Well, good. And that's all the announcements I'm giving you today. If you want more, you just have to read and ask questions because I'm not doing it anymore. So let's stand and receive the benediction. Now to him who is able to do far more than
than we can ask or imagine. To him be the glory in our lives, but in his church and in the world. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed.